Everybody knows what kind of plant is this one? Who doesn't like tequila, right? The problem that this is 99.9% .9 of how we produce tequila in central Mexico. But there's a problem with that because you can see compacted soils, you know, erosion, degraded land. And we now call them uh, blue deserts because this is the blue agave. But three years ago, we started working with some people down in, in Jal the state of Jalisco was related to tequila. And the only ingredient that we put on that regeneration was livestock in sync with nature. So only between two and three years, we were able to do that. No seeding, no fertilizer, no mechanical work, no spraying, just a client that was willing to try different things. So we promote all kind of life on that agave plantation. And our tools, sheep, donkeys, and horses. Now let's go to a drier environment where we do cattle ranch. The Chihuahuan Desert, which is actually the largest desert of North America. Drier obviously more challenging than central Mexico because of less rain. And you can see that is the Chihuahuan Desert. Large extensions, pretty dry, bare ground, unproductive, lifeless, a lot of degradation. As my dad used to say, you know, when I got the rains of the ranch, you're going to dance with the ugliest. But wasn't the Chihuahuan Desert that way always? We don't think so. You can see that gully that is nearby my ranch. That fence that is hanging in there, that was put only 50 years ago. But the important thing there is that there's a layer of carbon, about one meter. There's nothing anymore, there's spare ground. So that layer of carbon was put not by mesquite, not by other bushes we have, but by tall grasses. That is one clue. The second one is the historical ecological perspective. And that is a book that writes about the expedition of the Spanish priests going from Santa Fe trying to find a way to Monterey, California. So they were one of the first explorers trying to find or explore that the Southwest. When they went through Salt Lake, Utah, they literally said, we haven't really seen such a beautiful lush grasslands anywhere in New Spain. So given that context, the question is always, is it really livestock enough to bring the biology that we need to get us the certified lands back on track? Obviously, the answer is yes, because we are doing it in our own ranch. So nowadays, well, with the animal impact that we have, that we can see there in the Chihuahuan Desert, in our own ranch, in an area that only gets between 8 and 10 inches per year, we are able to grow native six tall grasses with only six inches. How do we do it? Through livestock mimicking nature. Now these were these used to be our winters ten years ago. You can see a lot of bare ground, oxidized, gray grass. So we had to feed the cows for almost six months. Now look at our winters nowadays. We not only grow grasses where we are, we actually grow better grasses. We not only grow quantity, but also quality of grasses. So you can see on the right side, yes, is my ranch 
under more intentional grazing, the greener side, on the same day with the same precipitation. On the left side is a ranch nearby where the cows are more spread out, not enough animal impact. So we are living different realities and it's all about management. I also want to share with you these pictures. So what happened during a period of six years at the ranch? That is a reference point, so bare ground. Now the first thing that comes with animal impact of the three years is these broadleaf florian plants, or we also know them as weeds. Yeah, a lot of ranchers just hate weeds. But we need to respect the natural succession from bare ground. I mean, we just cannot jump from bare ground to perennial grasses. We need to respect natural succession going, you know, from bare ground to weeds, annuals, and then perennials. So after three years, now we are growing grasses. No irrigation, remember folks, no seeding, no mechanical work, no spraying. Just being patient, disciplined, and bringing the biology that our cells need through livestock. We have a big problem in the U.S. with invasive species. We spend millions of dollars fighting, you name it, in my context, mesquite, creosote, you go up north, juniper, uh, shoya cactus, and so on. Well, our approach, we work for what we want, not what we don't want. We don't fight nature. So now in our ranch, grasses are actually taking over those invasive species. Now, the thing is that why would I kill a mesquite if it is still doing photosynthesis, still putting carbon in the soil? I just wait for the grasses to grow, and nature is going to decide, you don't need that mesquite anymore. Done. Deal. Now, let's talk about water here. And this is important, folks, because many people ask me, OK, people unrelated to ranching, it takes too many liters to produce one kilo of meat. Let's try to see this in a holistic way. I did an infiltration test on bare ground like you see it there in the Chihuahuan Desert. And in my grasslands, a water infiltration test on bare ground, we are only able to infiltrate two inches per hour. Where I do have grass, like that picture, 18 inches per hour. I don't even get 18 inches, but I can infiltrate 18 inches. If we extrapolate that difference between the two tests, and multiply that by 30,000 acre, acre ranch, which is the size of a ranch, we can meet the water needs for a full year for 100,000 people. 100,000 people. That is the potential there. Now, there's also the microclimate that we can create. So the left side is a ranch in Chihuahua, which is actually has the soil covered with grasses. So they can infiltrate the water, and they can do what we call the evapotranspiration, which will seed the clouds, and then you have that extra rain. The right side, I believe, is a more continuous grazing, no holistic management grazing. So we are experiencing at least 10% more rain than conventional ranchers. So if you see, we're infiltrating more water, but also we're getting extra rain. So we're making a more resilient uh, system. Another aspect that you need to think about it is the more diversity we have in our ranches, the more resilient our ranches are. We work very close with the Burr Conservancy Organization in the U.S., and they do transects every year. Ten years ago, we have 20 different species of grasses. Two years ago, 80 different species of grasses. We didn't see anything. It was the cow fertility that awake those seeds waiting for the right conditions to appear. The other thing is that we are rewilding our place. 
we put all these trail cameras across the ranch, and now all these pictures are from our ranch, including the epic predator, which is a golden eagle. But that is just observation. The beautiful thing is that partner, partnering with these bird organizations, now we have a modus tracking station at the ranch that is now giving us the hard data that we needed to tell people what is good for the cows is good for the birds. So that path that you have there is actually one of the most endangered migratory birds that is calling or ranch their home. This is, I'm trying to show you here, our grasslands at the ranch. So we have converted 30,000 acres of grasslands of what used to be bare ground 15 years ago. So I think we were born to see beautiful things, and that is this kind of management that is allowing us to do so. And this has been a community effort. We are now getting to 3 million acres just in the state of Chihuahua. Thank you.